Okay, thanks. Cheers for that. Um, actually, give this to you guys. Cool, so now it's week eight, lecture A. Thank you. Good. All right. Week eight, lecture A of thermodynamics. Thanks for coming along. Um, today, I thought I'd review, well, just mention last week's lecture and open up to questions about last week's content. And then the topics I want to cover today are isentropic efficiency. Uh, I want to say a little something about heat and work because it's not, I'm going to turn myself down, sorry about that, because it's not necessarily obvious, uh, but it is useful. So there's an analogy you can make between heat and work that can be useful. Uh, and then we should spend the last hour on the Rankine cycle, which is a steam power cycle. I was going to go into advanced Brayton cycle, so there's, there's two ways I could have gone, having introduced the Brayton cycle. I could have gone the advanced version, but on reflection I thought I'll do all the basic cycles and then I'll come back and do the advanced versions of the cycles afterwards. Because there's some advanced stuff we can do with the Brayton cycle, there's some advanced stuff we can do with the Rankine cycle. Um, but we might benefit from a second go at the cycles anyway, um, so that might be useful. So what did we do last week? We did the Braden cycles. This is the one-hour lecture on Wednesday. Um, the Braden cycle was used in what real-world thermodynamic device? The gas turbine engine. Excellent. I had a good question on, uh, I think it was on the Teams forum, that I think is worth mentioning. Someone said, when I choose my real-world device for my assignment, do I just have to choose a heat pump, or do I have to choose a specific manufacturer model device? And my response is categorically a specific manufacturer model device. So you don't say, I'll do my assignment on a car engine. You say, I will do my assignment on this engine, this model, this year model, you know, whatever. It's used in these cars. You don't say, you know, a jet engine. You say, whatever the Rolls were, Rolls Royce T940. Use on the triple seven, right? So you want to be very specific about the device you choose, um, and it can be a little bit. You don't have to do something only based on these cycles that we introduce in class, but it needs to be thermodynamic in nature. So don't do something that's primarily kinetic energy or is another form of analysis. Do something that's thermodynamic analysis. That's more getting on into these items. Just some admin. I just wanted to cover. Did anyone not get an email from me last night about your PSS room change? I sent out a, emails last night. Um, all of the problem solving sessions for this week have changed their rooms, and the ones on Wednesday have been reallocated their times to either Tuesday or Thursday. Did anyone not get that email? They've checked their emails this morning, they didn't get it. Good, I was using an old class list that I had already saved, and so if you had swapped labs, or if you had swapped PSSs, you might have been given the wrong information. There was a news post as well that hopefully gave you the right information. Was any of that unclear? I wrote the email late at night. I was writing to seven different groups of 50 students each. Um, I'm very aware that I could have gotten something wrong. Did you read something and say, no, the email that was sent to me was unclear, incorrect. Excellent. So don't go to your normal room. Go to the larger room. If you're on Wednesday, attend something else. Um, initially, when, um, when the course schedule for the, for the session came out, I said to myself, ah, PSS attendance is generally pretty low anyway. People who would otherwise go on Wednesday can just go anywhere else. Then I thought, well, I'm assessing week eight PSS material in the class test in week nine, so probably we'll have higher attendance this week than normal. And with three PSSs, I wanted to allocate you somewhere so you didn't all turn up on Thursday afternoon to that session. So that's what that email was about. Just trying to allocate out some, uh, some rooms, excellent. If you don't talk to me, I keep talking because I assume you know what I'm saying. Uh, 
Assignment questions. I just, I just spoke to two of the questions I got on the forums. Or one was on a forum, one was a face-to-face -face question. You've had a little while to look at the assignment now. How's it going? Have you selected your pairs or decided to work individually? Who, oh, just out of interest, just statistically across the class, who's working in a pair? Yep, and who's working as an individual? This is totally... Okay, so most people are working in pairs and there's about 20% of people who didn't put up their hand. So they're either non-responders or... Haven't worked it out yet, that's okay. Um, who has worked out the general class of the device that you're working on. I'm working on a... Okay, who is yet to work out the general class of device that you're working on? Okay, so I think more people are still working out what they're gonna work on. That's okay, so you probably wanna lock that in in your pair. Um, the nature of content delivery and when the assignment's due is that if you choose, for example, a refrigeration system, you're going to have to do some research yourself because I'm not going to teach the content for a couple of weeks' time. So I like refrigerators and air conditioners. Um, I think there's benefit to your learning if you do the learning yourself and then come to class and I just tidy things up. But um, if you do the auto cycle, the diesel cycle, you've already been presented with the material. If you do some of the others, it'll be later. Are there any questions about the assignment? Yes. Yes. Mm. Good question. If you're doing it as a pair, how is that done? If you do it as a pair, you'll submit one submission with both your ZIDs on it. Yeah. And don't, in the report, indicate who did what. You'll both get the same mark. If you, if you do it as a pair, you two do it as a pair, and you do it as an individual, I'll mark your report. Now if you, I won't mark it, I'll allocate that to other people. Sorry if that offends you. Mark your report, I'll have your report marked using the same standards and criteria. Okay. If you get 13, you get 12, or you know, whatever, sorry. You both, both reports re receive 13, you get 13, you get 13, you get 13. Okay? And they're all 10 page reports. Yes, yep. And you manage as a pair how you divide up the work within your own team and there is no scope for you getting 14 and you getting 12 because you tell me you did more work, no scope. Choose your own pair, work it out together. So the, the report requirements aren't less if you do it as an individual, they're not more if you do it as a pair. So I'm giving you that freedom. Um, does that clarify that point? Great, excellent. Are there any other questions about the assignment? Saying hello, excellent, good. All right, uh, laboratory questions. We should chat about labs, cool. Um, lab T1, you booked it in Moodle, you did the pre-work video and so forth, you booked it in the Moodle and you did the lab, you put your data in. Lab T2, you attended a uh, demonstrated lab. Sorry for the confusion that caused, about uh, not quite 10%. About 8% of the class didn't attend Lab 2, Lab T2, which I consider to be a deficiency of my communication as to the requirements for Lab T2. Hopefully it's clear that for Lab T4, you attend as per your class schedule. So when you enrolled in MN 2700, you selected a class that was either in week 10 or 11, attend that class. You've got a quiz Monday of week 9, it's in your class timetable, attend that class. About 1% of the class didn't um, attend the quiz on week six Monday. Attend the classes that you're scheduled to attend. Lab T3 is nominally happening now, so I'll release the, the spec. You took data in Lab T1 that you didn't use in your analysis of Lab T1. And I specifically said for Lab T3, you just take this data. And that was after you've done your expansion process, so the air goes from the high pressure tank to the low pressure tank, sorry, from your perspective, goes from the high pressure tank to the low pressure tank, right? There's a temperature difference generated, that's your lab T1 data. Your lab T2 data is, those temperatures then equalize back out, temperatures and pressures equalize back out. We can use that to calculate the entropy, assuming the air is an ideal gas. Um, 
So that will be lab T3. So it's a calculation involving the data that you collected. I had two options. One was you could go and do lab T1, come back, and then go again the next two weeks and spend another half hour just collecting that one piece of data, or you could sit there for three minutes while it equalized, take that reading, and then you're good. So I chose to do that. Um, hopefully you value having a fortnight with no labs, you know, a little bit more time to, for example, work on your assignment uh, and so forth. The laboratory report, I put a, a suggested template and a marking rubric and the specification up for the lab report. Who's read it? Who hasn't read it? It's okay, it's due in Friday week 13. So that's okay, but it's, it's using the data from the other labs, so about 80% of the room hadn't read it, You're using the data from the other labs to write a report. Um, maybe after the assignment is handed in, I'll readdress lab questions. I'll just get up in front and say, okay, ready, now the assignment's in, who's read the lab spec and what do you think about it? And we can, we can address it there. Um, are there any other administrative questions, concerns, comments? Excellent. Let's cover some content. Eyes and dropping efficiency. Good. Thanks for giving me a few minutes to cover that sort of stuff. It's just um, some housekeeping. I normally try and cover housekeeping not in lectures. All right. At the moment, we should be aware of two different efficiencies. We've mentioned them in class. Can anyone name one of the two different efficiencies that we've already mentioned. It's not isentropic efficiency, that's the one we're doing now. But there's two other efficiencies we've mentioned. Yes. Thermal efficiency, something to go with your apple, is up, oh, ah, oh. dreadful. Um, thermal efficiency is one of the efficiencies that we've mentioned. And can someone define thermal efficiency? I said the thermal efficiency of this auto cycle is 45%. Yeah. No, that's a different thing. But no, no, you, you, you're going to the second one, which is good. But how do we define thermal efficiency? Isaac. Yeah, so desired output divided by the energy required to make it happen. So we would. All right, so we have, I think we've been saying thermal efficiency. We've been saying, and that's for a heat engine, for a refrigerator and a heat pump, it's a bit different. Okay, but thermal efficiency has been work net, what you desire, divided by Q net, what you have to put in. Actually, sorry, it's not Q net. That would be silly for reasons that may or may not be obvious. Q in, I apologize. Work net divided by Q in. Work net equals Q net for a closed cycle. <clears throat> so that would give you a one. So that's thermal efficiency. Now, oh, I've forgotten your name, it's terrible. But you were alluding to a different type of efficiency, and that was called? Oh, it's not counter cycle efficiency, but it's very close. So I'll, I'll pay it because you're thinking along the right lines. So it's second law efficiency. Someone caught it. That'll do. <laughs> Casual. Um, right, so second law efficiency and you defined it correctly, is then, so we can say second law efficiency, is the thermal efficiency divided by what the thermal efficiency would have been if it was the Carnot cycle. So for the same maximum temperature in the cycle and minimum temperature in the cycle, you can calculate as Carnot efficiency. You can calculate your thermal efficiency after you analyze the cycle and know work net and Q in. Then you can get a second law efficiency, which is how well does your device compare to a Carnot ideal device in the same situation. So those are the two efficiencies we've covered so far. We're talking about a third efficiency now. And I just want to try and make it clear that this is a different thing. So this is isentropic efficiency. So I guess the, the big point is Isentropic efficiency is the efficiency of a shaft work machine. So we've been saying uh, a turbine reduces 
the pressure of the fluid from 10 megapascals to 100 kPa in an isentropic manner. Isentropic here means ideal, perfect, right? What if it's not perfect? What if I said with an efficiency of 92%? What does that mean and what can we do about it? So that's what we're going to talk about um, as our first topic this morning. So, this is recap. I prefer doing it as an interactive thing. So we define thermal efficiency. Work out minus Q in. That should probably be work net. The higher the efficiency, the more we get of what we want. So this is our first law for steady state, steady flow systems. Right? Heat minus work plus mass flow times enthalpy minus mass flow out times enthalpy equals zero. And if you assume that you've just got one inlet, one outlet, which is not always true, but it's a nice assumption to start with, and work is what you want, this power, because it's um, got the dot above it, so power is what you want. If you said Q was either zero, adiabatic, no heat flow, or negative by some amount. So typically you lose heat from a turbine. Let's think about turbines first. They're a bit simpler. Typically you lose heat from a turbine uh, because the turbine is hot. So the Q term is either going to be zero or slightly negative. Your mass flow is going to be defined by your system. And say you've got a fixed enthalpy in, so let H in be fixed, all right? So how do we define 100% efficiency for the turbine? And it's what we've been doing, which is 100% efficiency would be if it was isentropic. So it's not clear just from this because, you know, we've fixed Q, we've said Q will be zero would be adiabatic, that would be excellent, right? We've fixed M. We're saying we're putting a certain fluid into the turbine, all right? And so really you get the most work when H out is as low as it can be. So as, as little energy as you can have in the fluid as it leaves, that means you've got more energy that you use to generate your, in this case it's turbine, maybe you're generating electricity. Uh, that would be a normal thing to do with the turbine. Maybe you're running a shaft that's running a compressor in a Brayton cycle, um, back running a shaft through back work. Okay? So you want H out to be as low as possible. But you can't just get a H of zero out of everything. You don't just get liquid water at zero degrees C, which is the arbitrarily defined H equals zero point for us, our steam tables, out of every turbine. H out will have some value and will be based on the, the ideal, the best value of H out will be based on an isentropic process where there's no change in entropy through the turbine. So then, in that case, how do we define efficiency for a turbine compressor pump? Okay, so now we know what the ideal amount of work that we might possibly get out of a turbine will be. Well, we can divide that, um, or we can use that on the bottom of what the work we actually get out of the turbine is. So we can say, how much work did I actually get out of the turbine? divided by how much work would I have gotten out of the turbine if it was ideal, and let that be the turbine efficiency, okay? You'll note that this is just for a single device. So when we talk about thermal efficiency, uh, or car, you know, second law efficiency, typically we're talking about uh, through a cycle. So a cycle is undertaken, what was the work net and what was the Q in through the cycle, okay? So the other two types of efficiency we've been talking about are large system level, cycle level efficiencies. This is a device level efficiency. So this is the efficiency of just that turbine. So if you're asked for the turbine, uh, asked for the efficiency of a, of a single device, turbine compressor pump, it'll be asking for the isentropic efficiency. Or if you're given the efficiency for a device, turbine, this turbine has an efficiency of 92%, it's talking about the isentropic efficiency. So this is the definition in words, okay? The definition in 
formulas, like as a, as a formula would be, H1 minus H2, and sometimes you'll see this have a little A after it, H2 actual, I think Sendrill and Bowles uses that, uh, Reisel just uses two. So this is the enthalpy of the incoming fluid minus the enthalpy of the outgoing fluid as it actually existed, divided by the enthalpy of in in the incoming fluid minus what the enthalpy would have been if the device was 100% efficient on the bottom. So you'll notice the number on the bottom will always be bigger than the number on the top. There'll be a greater difference in the ideal case than there is in the actual case. Um, so what I've written down here, H2 will be greater than H2S. And so your actual work will always be less than your ideal work. Or your actual power will always be less than your ideal power. And your efficiency is the ratio then of those two numbers. It might be a little bit counterintuitive. That, so an actual process will leave, so say you went between two pressures, 10 megapascal and 100 kPa, let's just say, a non-ideal turbine, the outgoing fluid will be hotter, same pressure, hotter than in the ideal case. So it won't extract all of the thermal energy out of the, out of the fluid as it goes through. Um, this is then a diagram, so this diagram is from Reisel, so it's saying that you might have a, an ideal turbine that would go from 1 to 2S, but our actual turbine has a process that goes from 1 to 2, and in this case, if it was 2S, it would be a saturated mixture, and if it's 2, it'll be a superheated fluid um, because it's kicked off to the right. You notice we're tracking T and S here. So we're, we're going to move from PV diagrams to TS diagrams, particularly as we go to the Rankine cycle, which we're doing today. Um, they're more useful. Cool. How is everyone with that as a concept? Go. That is the definition. So that, that is the equation that defines it. Okay. Is that exactly the same as the definition above it? Because wouldn't there be a Q in it? Q would be equal to Q1 divided by Q1. Yes, that's a good question. Sorry, the question is should there be a Q here? And a Q at the bottom. I think I've assumed the turbine's adiabatic because that would be a normal assumption. Let's think about if it wasn't. If it wasn't adiabatic, then you'd lose heat and that would be colder and it would appear more efficient than it actually is. No. So if it's not an adiabatic turbine, then you'll need to include a Q term. Yes. Yep, so that should, yep, work. Is that better? Does that fit better with you? So it's at the actual work that you get out, or power that you get out, divided by the ideal power that you get out. This one, this one must be adiabatic. Well, because, because it's an ideal process, it must be. But yes, the top line may not be adiabatic. So you might lose some heat. It's pretty normal to assume that turbines are adiabatic or that the heat loss, the ratio of heat loss to power that you're getting out of the unit is so small as you can neglect it. Is not an unusual uh, assumption to make. No, it's a good question. And it, it draws out that I've just simplified without um, justifying the simplification. So thank you, I appreciate that. Good, any other questions, any thoughts? Good, have chocolate. Good question. All right. Keep going. So, what about if it's a compressor? Or a pump? So this is now we're raising the pressure. So what do we have to do? And we find that we actually need to spend more work, we actually need to expend more power compressing a fluid than we would ideally. Actually, sorry, I do like some, another aspect of what you said. Um, what was your name? 
Annabelle, thank you, Annabelle. I did like another aspect of what you said because you said, can it be adiabatic but not isentropic? So yes, absolutely. So if you've got a turbine, I need some more space. That's my problem. What do we got? Let's have some space over here. This turbine, for example, you've got, you've got fluid coming in and fluid going out. Oh, <clears throat> let me change my colour. I was, <laughs> my son was drawing on my surface last night. I was like, hey, there's this cool um, star thing. All right, and you can do that. And he was loving it. Um, whatever. And he screamed when I took it off him. And what are you going to do? All right, cool. Sorry. So you've got fluid going through this turbine. Okay. One can imagine this turbine would be insulated, which is actually not a bad assumption in, in some senses. So the, the, the heat loss is far less than the power that you're getting through the unit. Right? But as the fluid travels through, it's going to hit the stator blades and the rotor blades. And if you want to see what stator blades and rotor blades look like in a turbine, you can look at the device that's sectioned just as you walk into the lab, right? So you've got a, um, you've got a compressor and turbine <coughs> in that jet engine there. Okay. And as the air comes through, let's have blue for air. That'll work. Right. As the air comes through, it's going to swirl and have slight areas of turbulence and unconstrained expansion and so forth. And so when the gas comes out, it's going to be hotter for the same pressure than it would be if it had travelled through in an ideal sense. So that's how you get this, this uncontrolled expansion, uh, friction, so friction past the wall, that sort of thing, is what makes a turbine not isentropic, even though you can insulate it quite well and have it approximate adiabatic. So yes, that's a good, that was a good pick up as well. Yeah, go. Yeah, I just have a quick question about, like, how would you define state to S, or at least what is the, does the S really stand for anything in the <coughs> How do you define state to S? Yes, so we can calculate state to S, actually. At the moment, we can calculate state to S easier than we can calculate state to actual. Because we've already done questions. I'm trying, I'm trying to remember. I can't, I know. Sorry, I'm writing a couple of different quizzes. I'm writing your final exam. I'm like, have you already asked this? Have you already answered this question? I don't know. Don't take this as a, it's not necessarily a question anyway. But I think you've already answered um, a question saying, like, pressure, you know, a fluid enters a turbine at five megapascals in this pressure, exits at this pressure, isentropically, what's the, we're certainly not in class in lectures. Um, what's the work output, right? And so to do that, you've said, well, S equals, so if it's steam, you look up the table, you say S equals this at the beginning. I assume that S is the same. Is it superheated? Is it in the mixed region? If it's in the mixed region, I calculate quality, calculate enthalpy. If it's in the superheat, I interpolate on the superheat tables. Right, so you already know how to calculate H2S, right? Um, now I'm giving you a formula to calculate H2 actual based on a, a given efficiency. It's 90% efficient, it's 95% efficient. H2 actual is what you want to calculate. Um, it's not unusual. So the two things you might get is you might be given the turbine efficiency and required to calculate H2A, or you'll be given H2A and required to calculate the turbine efficiency. That would be normal things to, to look at. So you've taken some measurements on your turbine. How efficient is your turbine? where you can do this ca calculation, or you've been given a manufacturer specification that gives you your efficiency of turbine, what's the enthalpy of the fluid as it goes out, the quality maybe, um, as it goes out, where you can calculate H2A. So yeah, H2S, it has definition, I think we've already calculated it. We're certainly gonna do a calculation based on this um, today, this morning, right now. Good, I love it. No? Good. If you're not in the front little segment and you want to ask a question, just say hey as you put up your hand. I'm just slightly short-sighted and might miss you um, otherwise. And I appreciate the interaction. So before we do a calculation, let's flip it over and say, okay, now we're compressing a gas. Uh, that would be normal. So you're compressing an ideal gas, for example. What we find is you have to put in more work into the compressor to compress between the same pressures than you ideally would have to. Okay, 
And so now we say, well, what would be the ideal amount of work I would have to put in to compress the gas? And we divide that by the actual amount of work I have to put in. And this gives us a smaller number divided by a large number. It gives us an efficiency less than one again. So I'm just gonna go back to the turbine just so you can see the difference. So here we say actual on the top and uh, ideal on the bottom. For a compressor we say ideal on top and actual on the bottom. The great news is, well I don't, mm, I don't necessarily remember these, just like this is me. I don't necessarily remember these. I calculate it and if I get a number more than one, I flip it over. Um, because I'm real loose with my, my definitions. Um, so what does that look like? This is H2S minus H1, or divided by H2, whoop, A, right? That, that A is optional depending on the notation of your textbook. Um, you'll find that these are the same thing. This is the same formula. When you put a minus sign, you know, times the top and the bottom by minus one, you flip the, the entropies over, en enthalpies over. Uh, and we will find that H2A will be greater than H2S. So you'll find that if you compress, um, if you find you'll, if you compress a substance in a real compressor, you'll generate more heat than you would in an ideal case. And so H2 actual will be greater than H2. Again, yes, you're right. If there's heat loss, it won't. You'll have to take that into account. Um, and so you'll actually have to put more work in to compress things than you would like to ideally. Pictographically, we want to go from pressure one to pressure two. So we want to go in a straight line, vertical line on the TS diagram. In reality though, our real process kicks off to the right and our entropy increases as the process is undertaken. And you can imagine these processes being part of a cycle and I think we'll see some cycles as we go along. So, let's do a calculation and let's partially address your question of pretty typical. Is this either a typical question for like a quiz one or two style quiz or is it a typical part of a question for a final exam type um, thing? You might have a non-perfect uh, turbine or compressor and be required to calculate between them. So steam passes isentropically through a turbine from a pressure and temperature to a pressure what are the properties of state 2S and what does the turbine work? Uh, so we should do that. Have you got a feel for how you might start doing this kind of question? Have you just got a sense? Uh, let me come over to... So now we're talking ideal. So now we're saying the turbine is isentropic, okay? And then we're gonna introduce an efficiency, a turbine efficiency, and do the calculation. But I wanted to start in a place that I think you know. All right, draw a TS chart. Let's have a go. Cool. Let's do black. T, S, all right. TS chart, when you're dealing with a vapor, sorry, when you're dealing with a pure substance, you want to draw a vapor dome uh, on any charts that you do. For lab T4, you'll be expected in your final report to draw a pH chart, it's a pressure enthalpy chart, okay? If it doesn't include a vapor dome, it's really tough to see what the process is. So include a vapor dome in your final report for your lab, when you address lab T4. That looks like a vapor dome for water. Um, in fact, it looks like a vapor dome for most substances. What's the highest this curve gets? Just out of interest, does anyone know that temperature? We're doing well. No, no, no. It's fine. It's just something you might want to consider. So that's the critical temperature of water. So that's going to be 374. I'm going to say 375 because my drawing is rough enough. That's okay. And in terms of S, you're going to end up with zero here and about a nine here. 
Oh, you know what? I've got a lecture prepared for it, how to draw these. We will see how we go today as to whether we do it. Um, and the S peaks at about four and a half. So that's our vapor dome located on our, on our thing. Now what have we got? We've got temperature of 650 and a pressure of nine. So the temperature is gonna be up here, for example. Oh, that looks like about a 650 kind of line. Now the question is, what is our entropy at that? I think we need to turn to our thermodynamic tables, property tables, and get a value for S in order to draw the TS chart. So, where do I have those? Do, do, do. Tables for reference. Well done, Phil. All right, looks like it's not saturated, looks like it's superheated. What was the pressure? Nine megapascals. Nine megapascals, temperature of 650. So we're looking here. So these are the values that we're going to use. Okay, we can see we've got an S just above seven. Um, actually, let's... Copy, because I feel like we're going to refer to this a couple of times. Do, 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 do. Paste. Awesome. It's not where I want it. That's okay. Go there. All right. So, pressure of nine, temperature of 650. So this is the data we're going to use from our steam tables. So the S is gonna be 7.1, so it's going to start about there, okay? And we're gonna drop the pressure to 40 kilopascals. So we're gonna go, whoop, sound like this. And because I've already done this, I know it's gonna be in the mixed quality range. So it's gonna go down here. At 40 kilopascals of pressure, will the temperature be more than 100 degrees C or less than 100 degrees C? Just intuitively. Less, we agree, good. 76 degrees C. I looked it up earlier. Okay, so that's kind of what our state looks like. So we've got our state one, our state two, and we draw a vertical line with a downward facing arrow to indicate the state one to state two. Now, the other question is, what are the properties of state 2S and what's the turbine work? So now we wanna know, so it's isentropic. Isentropic is our key. So S1 equals, I said 7.1, but let's write it out properly, 7.0943 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So that's our S1. Our Pressure one is nine megapascals. Our pressure two is 40 kilopascals. We'll jump over and grab the pressure table, saturated pressure. For reference, copy. During the quiz, I could have said this at the beginning, I didn't. So because you get to keep the paper, the bit that's blue or yellow, and because it's got reference tables at the back, uh, what I noticed people doing during quiz one last year that I don't think anyone did this year, is you can rip the tables off the back and place them side by side in as much as you have space to do so. And so for quick reference between them, if you felt like you were flipping back and forward a lot, feel free to tear those off. You get to keep the blue and yellow paper uh, when you go home. So. With a known S value of 7.1-ish and a known pressure of 40 kilopascals, which I think is this one here, 76 degrees. Is the substance indeed a compressed liquid, a saturated mixture or a superheated vapor? Mm -hmm. Turn to your neighbor and convince your neighbor of what you think it is. Is it a compressed liquid? Is it a saturated mixture or is it a superheated vapor? 
And how do you know that? I'm saying that given a known S2 equals S1 equals 7.09, I'm saying you can determine that based on this, and it's something people struggle with. So have a minute. Good question. Okay, and back to me. Do you agree? Do you feel confident with your answer? What is the answer? Saturated mixture? Does everyone agree with that? To me, to me, I think if it was a liquid at that pressure, it would have an entropy of about one. If it was fully vapour, it would have an entropy of 7.7, .7, okay? And so it's somewhere between liquid and vapour. So some of it's liquid, some of it's vapour. And so I think it's in the saturated mixture range. If the entropy was 7 point, I would say entropy was 8 flush, I know that 8 is bigger than 7.7, .7, and so it must be a superheated vapour at that pressure. Okay, so that's how I convince myself of that in my own mind. Um, Hopefully that feels com comfortable and confident for you. Great question. Um, where do whoop, these numbers come from? I, just, I got a question which is good. So where's 375 come from and where's 76 come from? And indeed, where does 0 and 9 come from? And 4 and a half. So that's probably things I should just talk to for a moment. Um, you'll notice that. So 375, I propose that 375 is the temperature of the critical point. So above that temperature, you can only have superheated, uh, superheated uh, gas, vapour, right? And where I get that from is this is your properties of saturated liquid water, okay? It comes from a very low pressure and very low temperature up to a very high pressure and a very high temperature. And lo and behold, it only comes to that temperature, okay? So that's the highest temperature at which you can get a saturated mixture. And therefore, that is this peak temperature here. Okay, that's the highest point of the peak. Uh, where do I get my 76 degrees from? Like I said, I, I did this problem before I came. Right? At um, 40 kilopascals of pressure at a saturated mixture, I knew it was a saturated mixture, okay, the temperature is indeed nominally 76. Okay, just for tidiness, I didn't write 75 and a half, 75.9. Um, so that's where I got that temperature from. Okay. What about these ones here? This zero over here and this nine over here. So I get that from at the lowest temperature. Okay, so at the very low temperature, <clears throat> you've got a very wide span of possible entropies. Okay, so I come to my very lowest temperature on my saturated chart, very lowest pressure, very lowest temperature, and I find that the, if it was a saturated fluid, it would be zero, and if it was a saturated vapor, it would be a little sh a shy more than nine, okay? So that gives me my tails at the left and right hand side, gives me that point there and that point there. Yeah, they tend towards 9.15 and zero. Oops, I'm deleting things that I need like the axis. Can't be a chart without an axis. Where does the four and a half come from? At my very peak temperature, I say, well, what is the, um, what's the entropy at the very peak? And this one's kind of interesting. If it was a saturated liquid, it would be 4.43. If it was a saturated gas, it would be 4.43. Okay, so that's the point at which the two lines touch and there's no difference between the S of a saturated gas and the S of a saturated vapor. Sorry, liquid and vapor. 
respectively, for your, for your benefit. So we know that this line peaks at 4.4, and I'm just a bit sloppy with my numbers, so I said 4.5. So it's got the general form of a, gap, a graph you could use. Yes? Oh. Uh, it doesn't tend to go to a zero. The question was about what I've done here. If I delete that, would it? Oh, no. No, so it doesn't. Oh, that's a worse curve than I had before. Um, it doesn't tend towards zero. It does tend towards 0 0.01. That's a worse curve again. Um, in terms of temperature, it, it tends towards this number, 0 0.01 which is the triple point temperature of pure water. So it doesn't tend towards zero degrees C, it tends towards 0 0.01 degrees C um, for reasons I, I think I've explained earlier. Uh, da, 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 da. If you have to draw a freehand TS chart for water, oh wait, there's one more thing I should do, which is if I was worried, and I'm, partic I'm not particularly, but if I was worried about the shape of this curve, Okay. What I could do is I could go to a series of known temperatures or pressures because I'll, I'll pull the pressure chart in, but that's okay. Like 100 degrees C, 120 degrees C, 140 degrees C, 180 degrees C, whatever. And I could work out for 100 degrees C what the S of the fluid state is and the S of the vapor state. And I could draw those as little X's on my chart. And then I could draw a line joining my little X's. So to show you that, here, for example, um, I could come to 100 degrees C, which is about here, about one bar. That looks about right, 100 degrees C. And I could say, give me an X at 1.3, 100, and give me an X at 7.4, 100, okay? And then come up to 200 degrees C and say, give me an X at 2.3, 200 and give me an exit 6.4, 200. Okay, so you can redevelop a TS chart in detail from your tables. They represent the same information differently, graphically or in a tabulated form. Um, how's everyone doing with a TS chart? Same thing for pH. You, could, you can develop a pH chart from a table with just a little bit of diligence and nous. And I suggest that you'll want to for the refrigerant used in lab T4. Everyone doing okay? Good. No response is good. Good response. Um, great questions though. I appreciate that because it let me clarify some stuff. So now, we're, in an isentropic manner, we're reducing the pressure of steam from 9 megapascals to 40 kilopascals. So S1 equals... Um, 7.1, S2 equals S1 because it's isentropic, equals 7.0943 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So now what's the state? We're asked, what are the properties of state 2S and what's the turbine work, the ideal turbine work? So it's a saturated mixture. We've just established that. So it's going to have an X, it's going to have a quality value. And our quality is going to be our S2. I'm going to call it S2S. S2S, I ideal S2 minus S of the fluid state divided by S of the fluid gas, which equals 7.0943 minus S of the fluid state was 1.0260. 1 right? Cool. Divided by 6.6449. 6.6449. Quality equals. X to S. Mm -hmm. 
sorry, I didn't plug it into a calculator. I did I plug it into a calculator earlier. Um, so we do indeed find a saturated mixture, and according to my chart, okay, we would find that the length of this line divided by the length of that line would be 0 0.91, so 91% quality. Cool. Uh, we need a H2S. So the other thing we need is power, the work from the turbine, uh, the formula of work from a turbine. So it'll be work turbine S. Any thoughts on the formula for work from a, that we get from a turbine in this form? Difference in enthalpies. So it'll be H1 because H1 is bigger. Oops. Minus H2S equals what's H1? Come back up here. 3755.3. Three seven five five point three minus H two S, which will be zero point nine one three two times the difference in H's at that given pressure, which is this value here. Two three one nine point one. Two three one nine point one plus this value here, which is three one seven point six. Yeah, so I've just defined my H2S value in terms of interpolating on quality. And I'll have to go over here. I plugged in the calculator earlier. And the work equals 1319.8 kilojoules per kilogram. Excellent. So that's the ideal work. That's the most work we can possibly get out of a turbine if we give it, um, if we give it steam at 650 degrees C and nine megapascals, and we extract the steam at 40 kilopascals, which is very low. That's, so we're talking about low atmospheric pressure. We should talk in the Rankine cycle how we, how we achieve that. Um, then we can get this much energy per kilogram of fluid that we push through that turbine, that would be our isentropic, our ideal, our best case state. Okay? And question B must then be, because we're talking about isentropic efficiency, steam passes from the same state through the adiabatic turbine, so adiabatic, so Q equals zero, to a state of 40 kilopascals, so the pressure's the same, but now we're saying, just imagine that it leaves in the saturated vapor state. So not at 91% quality, but 100% quality. You think being 100% quality is better than being at 91% quality, but our turbine wants to take all the energy it can out of, the, out of the fluid. So now the turbine hasn't taken as much energy as it, as it did ideally, okay? Uh, we'll just we'll go to the second part later. Calculate the isentropic efficiency of the turbine is what I want to do, P point two. And then the other thing is, if we run it through a pipe and it cools down, what happens with entropy? We're talking about isentropic, so we're talking about an, an, uh, an entropic process. So I just want to track entropy as well uh, when we come back to this question. So let's take a break. Let's come back to this at 11.05, according to this number here. Have a think about that while you stretch and everything else. Cool. Come back in six minutes. Good? Excellent. All right, guys, it's 11.05. Let's re-kick off with our isentropic efficiency. Would you believe I was stressing out, thinking, I don't have enough content. What am I going to teach for two hours? Um, and, you know, here it is. An hour's gone past. We haven't even covered a single topic. So we'll, uh, we'll try and get to the ranking cycle. A uh, couple of great questions during the break. I appreciate having a break because it gives the opportunity for people who, sh look, I would appreciate if you put your hand up and said, hey, you got something wrong, or how'd you get this or whatever. Um, but I also appreciate it when you come and talk personally, so that's, that's fine too. 
uh, a couple of things that I, I should have said that I didn't. One thing I should, I should have said that I didn't and one thing that I just wrote the, uh, the analysis out wrong. Uh, one question was, why is this a 2S and not just a 2? So we're passing from state 1 to state 2, ostensibly, why have I written 2S? This is a really unusually phrased question and it's related to the fact that I'm just teaching the topic for the first time, so oh, it's kind of a bit tough. But So this is our isentropic case. What I wanted to do was ask the isentropic case and then ask the real case. And so for the isentropic case, steam passes isentropically, I had the steam pass from state point 1 to state point 2s. Okay, so that was our isentropic turbine. Now for the question we're just about to go to, which is question B, now steam's passing through an adiabatic turbine that's not isentropic, now it's going to start pass from state point 1 to state point 2. Okay, so I didn't make that clear. In your actual question, what you would actually get is you'd get a state point 1 and a state point 2, and you would have to kind of create a state point 2s for your own analysis purpose. What I did was I split that up. So I, I said, well, let's do that first, because you would have to do it first and let's do the, um, the efficiency afterwards. So I, I hope I didn't confuse anyone with that little fabrication um, of a construct there. The other question was, um, someone diligently, well done, uh, typed this equation into their calculator and didn't get a value of around 1300, they got a value of around 2000. In my haste to write it out and let you go on a break, I had neglected to put these brackets that I've now drawn in green. So what's, what's bracketed in green is the definition of H2S. And of course, we wanted H1 minus H2S. But if you didn't put the brackets in, as I, as I didn't, uh, this ends up being a plus, And you'll get a number that's about, what, 630. Incorrect. So 630 more than what you should have gotten. Um, that's just my lazy shorthand. I should have calculated H2S and then subtracted the numbers. But that's the answer nevertheless. So that was, uh, that was questions that came during the break. I appreciate it. Thank you for picking me up on my uh, lazy notation. Cool. So to finish off isentropic efficiency then, um, let's just answer this series of questions. So now we've got a similar sort of process, but it's going to now not X2S, but X2 um, of one, so it's a saturated vapor. Our process now, just on our TS chart, our process doesn't look like a vertical line anymore. It looks like a line that curves off to the right. And indeed touches at 40 megapascals, but at the saturated vapor state. So we would label this point, oh, I need more colors, star color, no. Um, let's label this point here. That would be state 2, and we'll label this point here state 2s. Other way around. So the ideal process is a saturated mixture. The real process is a saturated vapor. Excellent. Draw the process on a TS chart. Tick, as above. Calculate the isentropic efficiency of the turbine. All right. So. We had defined isentropic efficiency, turbine isentropic efficiency, as being the difference in H's actual divided by the difference in H's in isentropic sense. Yeah, so you get less power out than you want to, and so that'll give you a ratio that's less than one. Literally, I do that every time. I just check. So we know that we've got a H1 and we've got a H2, oops, H2 actual, and we've got a H1 and we've got a H2 isentropic. And we know the number at the bottom is 13, 19.8. Excellent. H1 we know is 3755.3. What's H2 actual? Well, we're given two independent intrinsic values, so which we can calculate it using. We're given a pressure of 40 kilopascals and a quality of one. 
just so you know, like I did this for you, right? So it would be easy. Um, so at 40 kilopascals and the quality of one, we should have a H2 actual of, oops, 2319.1. 2319.1. So that was just from table. And that should be Oops, I'm wrong. Whoop. That is HFG. Should be 2636.7. Sorry, because I want HG. 2636.7. Um, I... I advise bringing a ruler to the exam. And again, the paper is yours. So like, I physically draw a line on the sheet of paper when I'm looking up tables. Not in my textbook, because I don't draw lines in my textbook. But when it's printed out for me, I physically draw lines. All right, and what's that equal to? I don't know if I've got it written down. 11, 12. Excellent, good. 84.75%. Okay, so the isentropic efficiency or the efficiency of this turbine is around 85%. And so you get, where you should get a kilowatt of uh, power out of it, you get 850 watts of power out of it. Um, you want an isentropic efficiency in the 90 to 95 range. So this is not a great turbine. Um, in those terms. So we have calculated the isentropic efficiency of the turbine. Everyone happy with the application of that formula? The implications, what it means? Good. If the efficiency of the turbine was higher, we would have a saturated mixture. Because the other thing I could have said is, you know, it's a 95% efficient turbine, what's the H2 actual? What's the actual work of the turbine and so forth? Um, all right, so it would be a saturated mixture. If it was a less efficient turbine, it would be a superheated vapor. Calculate the entropy generated for each process. So it's not isentropic, so we should have entropy generated. So how are we doing that? Uh, so let's have a look at that. Our entropy generation equation, back from, so this is our entropy ba balance equation, is the DS for the system on dt equals sum of mass in entropy in minus sum of mass exit entropy exit plus across each of the thermal transition boundaries q at that boundary divided by the temperature at that boundary plus entropy generation sigma Now, this term on the left, so this is change in entropy within the system over time, okay? We've got a steady state, steady flow system, so our change in entropy in the system over time should be zero. We've got a system with only one mass flow, so this will be mass flow S in minus S exit, plus now we've got two processes here, I didn't kind of introduce them, but one's our turbine from state one to state two, and our other one is we're gonna reduce the temperature of the, of the substance back to X3, so X3 is gonna be X2S. So the question is, we can get to the same state, the same fluid state, but in one way, all the heat's drawn out in the turbine, in the other way, some of the heat's drawn out in the turbine as, as work, and then some is lost as heat loss in the subsequent piece of pipe work. So what's the, the uh, entropy generated as part of the two processes? So we, we are going to have a Q 
on T for one of the processes, so we need to include that, and we're going to have an entropy generation term as well. So for the first process, so for the adiabatic turbine, we'll have none of, no heat generation, uh, no heat transfer across the boundary, so it'll just be entropy generated is S exit minus S in, which is the S of the exit is the S at a quality of 1. So that's 7.6709, 7.6709, and the entry in was 7.0943. 7.0943. Uh, it's not specified in the question. Oh. Yeah, so I didn't, I didn't include mass flow because this is just a turbine. You don't know how much mass is flowing through it. It's a good question. Kilojoules per kilogram. Kelvin. So that's the entropy generated through the turbine. And in this case, because the process is adiabatic, the entropy generated is just the difference in the entropies in the two fluid flows. You say, where does the entropy come from? The entropy is generated as you have uncontrolled expansion and inefficiencies, friction and so forth throughout the turbine. So this would be entropy generated from one to two. And then we'll take the same equation, take this equation down here and look at a pipe flow where as the fluid flows through the pipe, it loses quality back to 91%, okay? And so it's steady state, steady flow again, so there's no change in the entropy over time, okay? And again, we've got mass flow, entropy in minus entropy out, plus the heat lost in the pipe divided by the temperature of the boundary, or the temperature which the heat is lost, plus entropy generated. We're given a boundary temperature, so we're given the temperature of the cold reservoir boundary is 60 degrees C. So we know our entropy in now for state, so we say state 2 to 3. We know our entropy in was 7.6709. We know the entropy of the exit was interestingly 7.0943 just because of the way I constructed the the problem? Yes. How come the quality's gone up from the exit of the turbine to the exit of the reservoir? Yep, sorry, so the quality here, x equals 1, and the quality here, x equals well, if I'm going to use that, let's go 0 0.9132. So the quality is going down as you have heat flow, Q, leaving from the pipe into the cold reservoir. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, I'm just kind of flipping back and forth between my calculations and the problem specification, assuming that you have read and understood the problem specification, but it's the first time you've seen it. So um, that's probably unfair. Thank you for asking the question. So that's our mass flow. Our heat must be our H3 minus our H2. So the heat here, so Q23 must equal, or it's going to be lowercase in this case. Q23 is going to be H3 minus H2. H2 minus H3. It's going to come in at a higher energy and leave at a lower energy. Nope. Sorry, 3 minus 2. Because it must be negative, because heat's leaving the system. So then this is H3 minus H2 divided by 
60 plus 273, so we convert our temperature, our boundary temperature to Kelvin. Oops, sorry, and we've transferred that to the other side, in which case this must be a negative. And that has to be a negative. Sorry, that's really bad. All right. I feel like I'm being really loose with my hand calcs, which might be confusing. Is everyone okay? H3 should be... So H3 should be what H2A was, because that's our definition of what we're doing. We're take, going back to the same... Um, or H2S, so that there is equal to our H3 and our H2 is given elsewhere. I'm going to throw this up as PowerPoint slides and I'll upload it because it's taking a long time and I'm going back and forth which I think is confusing. So I'm going to show the calculations of that in the uploaded PowerPoint slides on Moodle rather than keep mucking around with hand calcs. And I apologize that I've just stumbled through that for the last 10 minutes. So what I was trying to show was something about entropy generation, but I feel like I've lost a little bit about the conversation about isentropic efficiency. But Isentropic efficiency is something that you want to be able to calculate. You can have it for turbines and compressors and pumps. Um, and we, we did that calculation. So that's what we did. Yes. 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 So that's true. So total entropy generation. Sigma is going to be entropy generation in process one to two plus entropy generation in process two to three. Yes, it will be. Good question. All right. Apart from my butchered hand calc, are there any questions about isentropic efficiency, how to use it? Go. What's the generation? Yes. Is there a convention for total versus specific? It's a good question. I was hoping no one would notice. When the sigma notation is used, I don't know. I, I don't mind RISL, so sigma notation is what Central and Bowles uses. RISL uses a capital S gen for total and uses a lowercase s gen for specific entropy generation. And I think I prefer that. But the sigma notations used in a problem solving session um, questions and so forth. So, uh, my understanding of the sigma notation is the units are whatever you get from your calculation. So, you divide through our mass, and I, th I think it's loose, and I don't like it. But look, if you find something different, if you find information that's different, let me know, because um, I would like to know. Good question. Excellent. Let's do, this is just like a real quick work heat analogy uh, comment. And then we will introduce the Rankine cycle and we'll just do the basic Rankine cycle um, through that. Excellent. So you're already aware of this, but I just want to remind you and just put it in a different, just put them side by side. Uh, and so you can see some relationship that might not otherwise have occurred to you. So if work is pressure dV, and this is if you are doing work on a substance, this is the minimum amount of work that you need to do to affect a certain pressure change. If you're getting work from the substance, this is the maximum amount of work you'll get from the substance for a given pressure change. So actually, Work equals PDV only holds true if the process is reversible. So things like friction, things like turbulence, things like uh, processes that happen quickly 
aren't reversible, but this holds true if they are reversible. And so then the work is the integral, integral of PDV. So the, we've done this um, thing on the left. When we talked about entropy, we said, well, if it's a reversible process of heat addition or heat um, um, removal, then del Q equals TDS. Right? And so therefore, we get this on the right-hand side. So you say, well, those look pretty similar to one another. They look like they're in the same sort of form. Um, can we draw any analogies between them? I've mentioned what's on the left, but I haven't mentioned what's on the right, and I think it's worth being aware of. So if you draw a PV, if you draw a process on a PV chart, okay, the work, if the process is reversible, is the area underneath the curve that's drawn. And this is why it's path dependent, because if you went from one to two, by that means, the work would be greater. If you went from one to two, by that means, the work would be lesser, okay? The same is true of temperature, and in this case, oh, and of uh, heat on a TS chart. So if you draw a TS chart, and in this um, instance, I've drawn an isothermal uh, process, right? So there's some change in entropy without a change in temperature. So there must be a change in pressure. I've just indicated that in the top right hand corner. Then the amount of heat, so the kilowatts or kilojoules per kilogram or so forth, the amount of heat is the area under this chart if the process is done reversibly. So if we take those um, idealizations into consideration, then that's what you get. Um, what we'll see with our cycles then is if you plot a cycle on a PV chart, okay, and you've got something happens there, then it goes up, then it goes across, then it goes down, something like that, okay, then you can sum up the area under that and the area under that, and the subtraction of those two gives you the work net for the process. Same thing on a TS chart, okay, you might have, for example, a Carnot cycle, which goes up, across, down, and along. Okay, so that would be a Carnot cycle represented on a TS chart. Okay, the Q net for the cycle is the tall area, in this case, minus the short area. I've done vertical lines, uh, so I've done an isobaric, uh, isochoric process and isentropic process, just to make the, just so you're subtracting two numbers instead of four. And so this is work net equals area, and this is Q net equals area. And for a closed cycle, you know that Q net equals work net because the, um, the properties return to their same value after the whole cycle. And so you'll find that the area, the net area under a PV diagram chart will be the same as the net area under a TS chart. It just has some interesting implications. Yeah, go Lee. Can you just clarify the area inside the, um, inside the cycle? Yes. Sorry, yes. So when you end up subtracting that, then your net is actually the area within. And same here. When you subtract what's down the bottom, the net is the area inside, transcribe inside the, the cycle. Thank you. That's the conclusion for that. Excellent. So. That means that if you can draw a process uh, quite accurately on a TS or PV chart, then you can make comments about what would increase efficiency or decrease efficiency, <coughs> increase power, decrease power, just by looking at the graphics of how, how processes work. So I think that's useful, um, a bit faster than doing calculations sometimes. So I just wanted to show you that as a process. Any other questions? Thanks. Good, good point. Good. Let's talk about our next cycle. So of the six, officially six cycles that we're doing, we'll talk about the Rankine cycle. And this is something you're probably less familiar with in your everyday life, but nevertheless is quite important to us. Um, and at least for us, generates most of our electricity. This is a very simple question. I think you'll have some of these in your PSSs when we get 
up to the ranking cycle PSS. Consider a steam power plant operating on the simple ideal ranking cycle. So you need to know what simple and ideal assumptions mean. The steam's entering the turbine at a pressure. It's condensed at another pressure. Oh, sorry, and there's a temperature at the turbine entry. Determine the thermal efficiency of the cycle. So you're not given lots of data, so there's a lot that's coming out of the assumptions that are made. So we'll, we'll talk about that. There's four processes, and similar to a Brayton cycle, so these are processes that are spatially different, so they're not done in, in, like the auto cycle in the same cylinder. They're, they're separated by space, and they're all continually happening. So they're all steady state, steady flow, open processes. In the very simplest case, each of them has one inlet and one outlet. That's certainly not true when we get to more complicated ranking cycles, but we start with a basic and we go. So first of all, you start with a fluid and push it through a pump. The primary purpose of the pump is to increase pressure without requiring very much work to do so. And then you'll go through a boiler where you'll add heat. Typically you'll burn some fossil fuel uh, or similar. If it's solar thermal, you might shine concentrated light and in some way boil the working fluid. Then you'll go through a turbine whose primary objective is you lower the pressure and you get work out of the turbine. And you'll end up with something that's either superheated or a saturated mixture with quite a high quality. Turbines need quite a high quality um, of fluid to run through them. And so then you'll recondense the fluid, typically back down to a saturated liquid to restart the process. Unlike our air standard cycles, this is truly a closed process. So this isn't a, you get rid of the water when you're done and you bring in fresh water at the end. This is a closed process in the sense that the water that's traveling through stays inside the system, or certainly you'd like to. I won't follow that link, but you can. And it shows where the electricity in the different states comes from. For New South Wales, it comes from steam power. Yes. Do they connect the pump and the turbine on the same shaft? No. So no, in the Brayton cycle, yes, you had a through shaft, and that was how that worked. For this, so the other thing was Brayton cycle had a backwork ratio, and we calculated the backwork ratio for our sample, I think at 30 or 40 or 50%. So for the Brayton cycle, you put a, a large proportion of your electricity, or your power generated in your turbine, back into the compressor. We'll find for this, the ratio of pump work to turbine work might be 1%, 2%. So it's not unreasonable to take the turbine, turn it into electricity, and use electricity to run the pump. And that's you find that, that's what they do. That's a good question. Um, these are also much bit larger um, devices we find in practice. You know, a, a gas turbine engine, you would fit quite comfortably on this desk, you know, something that would work. A steam power plant, you would find wouldn't fit in the room. You know, these are larger devices. Uh, we can use inexpensive fuels, coal, obviously, but um, you can gas fire them. You can use mixed modes. So when I was in WA, they were clearing a bunch of trees to upgrade the coal fields highway. And we just threw some of the wood from the trees in with our coal into our, um, our burner. We could get up to a certain proportion and it wouldn't cause any problems. Uh, Nuclear energy, so for our purposes, nuclear is a source of heat uh, and can bo you can boil water with that heat. Concentrated solar, I mentioned as well. Large installations, baseload power, slow, slow to start up, slow to, slow to shut down. Um, the reasons that you do not want to use steam power is environmental, particularly like you've heard of brown coal power plants and so forth. Uh, you end up putting a lot of heat into the environment. So you either find a lake nearby and you pump heat into the lake. Uh, you can only do that for so long before the, it starts to affect the temperature and the, the sea life, encourages the wrong type of um, organisms to grow, or you have a cooling tower. And the way a cooling tower works, you got, I'm not, like Simpsons came out when I was seven, I think they started televising. But you guys all saw Simpsons. You know what I'm talking about, all right? Cool, you've got a nuclear power plant and you've got, you know, ostensibly smoke coming out of it. 
I'm so old. Um, right, you've got, you've got this, this stuff rising up. Okay, first of all, we can agree that it's steam and not smoke because a nuclear power plant shouldn't be burning any fuels. Okay, cooling towers generally, in terms of how they work, right, you get a hot liquid, you get hot water, and you spray it in the top. Okay, and you want to spray it into little tiny water droplets with lots of surface area to volume ratio. Okay, and then because it's hot, and because it's in small droplets, it will evaporate into the air. Okay? Now, air that's moist has a lower density than air that's uh, dry, because H2O is a lighter molecule than O2. Yes. Yeah? Two, two hydrogens and an oxygen is lighter than two oxygens or two nitrogens. Okay? And so your prevailing motion is upwards. Okay, so your lighter air wants to travel up and that pushes it up against the, the falling droplets. So your liquid droplets are coming down and your moist air is going up. Okay? Eventually, you have a little lake at the bottom and you need some holes inside to let the air come through. Okay? And you've got like a, a, just a shallow lake at the bottom. So as your liquid water droplets join the lake, now they've had evaporation go past them, and so now they're colder than they were when you sprayed them in. Okay, so that which remains as liquid water is cold, and that which passes off as steam, and you can see it in the atmosphere because then it recondenses back to water droplets as it rises out of this hot, moist environment. Um, that takes the heat away. So that's a cooling tower, and so you'll typically find that uh, associated with the thermal process. The water that you're doing this with isn't the same water that you're passing through your cycle. In fact, I think... Right, so here's a diagram from Reisel showing... Okay, you can see you've got your boiler here, your turbine, your condenser, and your pump. Right, that's a closed cycle. And then you've got an alternate cycle off to the right-hand side with a pump passing into the condenser, which is now a heat exchanger. So we can, we can analyze heat exchangers. We know how to do that. Passes water, that, then the warm water comes out, gets sprayed into the cooling tower. Okay, here's the lake of water at the bottom. Lake of water at the bottom of the cooling tower, which is then pumped out. And so you've got a cooling tower circuit giving you some water. And then you've got your circuit generating your power. And what's the reason you would do this? Keep it clean is a good... Do you want to give any more detail on that? Uh, well, because it's known to be open air, it could get all sorts of waste flow and stuff outside. Yep. Well done. So this water here... Whoop, this water here is very pure water. Okay, that's... You want that to be H2O, essentially. Right? This water here, I'm going to write tap. In industry, we call it potable. As in, you could put it in a pot and make food with it, like boil it for food. You know? um, so the right-hand side, you run on potable water, so you just have, or you, can, or you can have it as salt water. If you've got, nah, that's just going to chew out various things. If you had access to salt water, you'd do things differently. You wouldn't use a cooling tower. But you just run your cooling tower, and you have makeup water coming from your municipal like, water supply. Actually, in, in Worsley, we didn't even treat it. So we didn't put fluoride in it or chlorine or whatever. We just got water from a dam and um, used that as our makeup water. Cool. Just wanted to mention that. It's an important, it's not ranking cycle related, but it's an important part of how real devices work. So pure water is used as the working fluid. That would be a typical thing. You can also run it on refrigerants. We've mentioned that before. If you're uh, heat source can't get you up to high temperatures. The flow is provided by the pump, so the pump is forcing the whole process. And we'll find the pump uses very little electricity, uh, which is excellent. And then there's a pressure difference maintained by the turbine. We'll say external combustion uses a heat source. It may not be combustion, but you certainly don't use combustion inside the process, like you do with an auto cycle or a Brayton. So we were combusting the air we were working with, here, we're not using air, we're using a, um, a pure substance. 
turbine's producing work, that's driving a generator. Heat's added in the, in the boiler, and heat's removed in the condenser. So they're our main work and heat processes. You're also putting a little bit of work into the pump as well. All the devices, steady state, open flow. Steady state, yeah, open devices. The system is actually closed. It's not modeled as a closed system. It's actually closed. We've talked about pure water and potable water. Let me just scratch that out. Let's talk about the ranking cycle. We'll find that we could draw a line through the process here, okay, and say this is high pressure and this is low pressure. Right? So the pump creates pressure and, well, pumps create flow and back, the resistance to flow creates pressure, which is a fluid mechanics thing. But So the pump is producing flow and so you've got high pressure on that side. The turbine is producing a pressure drop, so you've got a low pressure. So in the ideal case, you say that everything on the left-hand side is at a certain pressure, everything at the right-hand side is a certain pressure. And you would hope that everything is isentropic, ideally. In reality, it won't be. If you're given an efficiency, you need to use it. We just talked about how to use that. And your work net will be the work you put in, get out of the turbine minus the work you have to put into the pump. Or you can do work net on a heat basis because work net equals Q net. So it'll be the work put, uh, heat put into the boiler or steam generator minus the heat is lost in the condenser. So you want to put as much heat into the boiler proportionally as you can and, and lose as little heat in the condenser as you can. Um, in reality, you must lose some heat in the condenser because of the turbine restrictions and so forth. If you're told it's a standard ranking cycle, what assumptions are you made? No pressure loss through the boiler and condenser, so you've just got the two pressures to deal with. Condenser outlet is a saturated liquid. So it's not drawn so here, but I sometimes draw condensers with an inlet and an outlet and a liquid water line. So if you have some sort of large tank and you keep the top as being vapor and you have the bottom having some fluid in it, some liquid in it, then you know that as it's leaving, it's a saturated liquid. If it was any more condensed than a saturated liquid, the vapor would raise the temperature a little bit until it became a saturated liquid. And you can do that in a control process. Yeah. Is it, can you state purely just from the heat transport from the um, condenser water line around the um, cooling tower, or is there something else happening in the condenser that changes it? How is it changing state? Like, yeah, it's like a hot, um, like a steam coming from the turbine. It's steam coming from the turbine. And It's a good question. We would normally model it as an adiabatic heat exchanger because the preponderance of the heat will be lost. So you'll have coils running through here and you'll have uh, cold water and warm water. And whatever the, whatever the delta H between those two must be the delta H with a rate between those two. So those two H's must be the same. So whatever energy, you rem thermal energy you remove from the steam to turn it into water must be thermal energy that you give to the cold water to make it become warm water. Yeah, that's where the energy is going. It's a good question, yeah. So you can enter to your like, ability to do work with the fluid. So why would you want to remove that? It's a good question. Why are we removing enthalpy? Because we have to, to get it back to the pump. Yes, it's a practical concern, but it's also it's a, just a true reality of life. Like in order to create a cycle, you, and, they, and all of them do this, you compress basically, so the compressor or the auto cycle, you compress or add pressure, then you add heat, then you reduce your pressure back, and then you remove your heat in some way. For the auto cycle, we're exhausting and drawing in fresh air. For this, we're physically removing heat in a condenser. At that point, the heat's not useful. It's, the temperature's too low for us to do anything about it. Yeah, it's good.
I'd prefer to have discussions like this than to get through the slides, just in case you don't know that about me. Um, so I really appreciate conversation. Good. Uh, what other assumptions would we make? Isentropic turbine and pump, if, unless you're told otherwise, and adiabatic except the boiler and condenser. So that would be a standard assumption that would make. Uh, that the only heat, places where heat is moved around, are the boiler and the condenser. This is what the process sounds like in words. We'll get through the process, we'll do the calculation. Not tomorrow. Tomorrow's Anzac Day. Don't come to uni. You'll be very lonely. Um, I'm just, I'm working out whether we're going to go to the dawn service. I would normally do a dawn service with an 18 month old. Vanessa said I can't leave both kids at home. <laughs> Fair enough. Sorry? Yes, probably. Yeah, if he gets up before dawn, I'm like, all right, son, in the car. Going down to Coogee Beach. All right. Process in words. So, we have a pump, which is ideally providing isentropic compression, and we can work out what it's going to do if it's not isentropic. We've got a boiler, isobaric, heat addition. We've got a turbine, isentropic expansion, condenser, isobaric heat injection. So these are four ideal processes in words. And this is the processes. Kellen, give me another five minutes. You might end up with a saturated mixture with a high quality, as we did before, or you might end up with a superheated uh, vapor at the end of your turbine. Right? If you've got this ideal versus actual case, you might end up with both of them being mixtures, one of them being mixed, the other being superheated vapor, or both being superheated vapors. Uh, you want to aim probably in a real design, something like this. So ideally it would be a, a mixture and actually it's going to be a little, little bit superheated. Because all four processes are steady state, steady flow open processes, we have a formula that we can use for those once we've taken out kinetic energy and potential energy, if we assume those are minimal. All right. And here are the four processes. Then, so this is trying to create an analogy between the, break, the way we analyze the Brayton cycle and the way we analyze the Rankine cycle. We find that the work from the pump is a very small number, A, and B, because we're in the compressed liquid region, we don't find a lot of uh, resolution in the tables for compressed liquid. And so there's a different way to calculate the work for a pump which isn't mentioned in Russell but comes through in Sengel and Bowles in his textbook, which is mass flow rate times the specific volume, and the specific volume changes through the pump, but not by much, like by a, a fraction of a percent. Um, what it does change significantly is the pressures. So the ideal work, the minimum amount of work you can put into compressing a substance through a pump is given by this formula in the bottom left-hand corner. I like it. I think it gives better resolution on the data. Um, because the pump power, the power you need to um, power the pump, is such a small fraction of the overall Rankine cycle power, uh, it doesn't matter which one you use. Because you, if you're a couple of percent out there, it won't affect your overall thermal efficiency. But you should be aware of both formulas. And our efficiency is our work divided by our heat, which is one minus our heat out divided by heat in. So. The lower we can get this number, the higher we can get this number, the more thermally efficient our cycle. That's thermal efficiency. We won't look at the next lecture, but we will look at improved Rankine cycle and say, well, how will we get our Rankine cycle to be um, more efficient? This is a big deal and has been done extensively uh, because that matters. Like you want to burn as little coal as you can to get as much electricity as you can. High temperature is one of those things. Again, temperature limited by materials. Low, how low you can get the temperature depends on how low you can reject the temperature into your environment. And, and is somewhat limited by low pressure because you create a vacuum in your condenser to get your temp low temperature down. We won't do that question 
Are there any questions at this stage just based on that cursory analysis base of Rankine cycle? Excellent. Have a great week and I will see you next week. Thank you.